Number 10, universities. Okay, owing a lot of school debt myself, I know a little thing or two about the educational institution. But when did they start and where and why? Universities have been around for like the last 13,000 years, apparently, with the newest uncovered Gobekli Tepe being flirted with possibly being the first university or educational hotspot in the world. But uni uni with like school colors and teams and stuff, that's straight middle high ages right there. University of Oxford was created in 1096. That's the classic riddle, isn't it? Which is older, the Aztecs or their Oxford? Ever heard that one before? Yeah, these things are like old, old. A university for law and medicine was created in the year of 1088, the University of Bologna in Italy. Yeah, it became a thing when an organized group of students under the Latin motto of quote, nourishing mother of the studies was created. Pretty academic if you ask me. University of Cambridge, 1209. Like this is like almost a thousand years ago, y'all. At least some of the middle ages had some good traditions along with like how to sever heads for court and stuff like that. I wonder if someone still owes school debt from like 1208, you know? Five shillings a month kind of deal. Number nine, Hastings. Medieval times wouldn't really be the medieval times without a couple of hundreds of swords clinking and clanking against a couple of other hundreds of swords clinking and clanking. Well, thousands actually. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was a crucial part of business back in the day. New treaty signed, new land discovered, usually started and ended with a battle. The Battle of Hastings, one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. Norman French army of William, the Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the Anglo-Saxon King Harold Godswinson. The childless King Edward the Confessor in 1066 set up a succession struggle between families and the throne. Harold was crowned king after Edward's death, but faced invasion by William and the Norwegian King Harold III of Norway. The battle lasted from dusk till dawn and William was crowned as king on Christmas Day 1066. Continued rebellions and resistance to Williams continued, but Hastings marked the start of this ancient British rule and cemented their place amongst Europe as the leading power in both army, academia, and religion. Basically, a really key time where everyone was fighting, Game of Thrones style for Europe. Like all of Europe. Lots of swords and heads type stuff. Number eight, taxes. Hey, tax season's coming up. Make sure you have everything nice and neatly organized. I know I don't. But why do we have to do them, you know? Where does this you owe me this come from? The Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book was a book created under William I, also known as William the Conqueror. The same name victor in the battle we just talked about. So medieval to name yourself the victor, isn't it? It is I, Kyle, the winner. Yeah, this guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this was the first time surveyors kind of went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for just doing you. Men would just show up at your house asking how much you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh Mildred? Right, and just another five for the phone plan. <sighs> Tax season's coming up. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Owing someone money for just living on their land, trying to make an honest living? How dare they? Thank God that didn't catch on. Speaking of, I got a phone H&R Block. Number seven, the Crusades. We hear about it a lot, but we need more movies and Netflix shows about this time because it's really rich in history here. A three-part miniseries spanning over like 300 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred lands and lands in the Middle East. Wars that resulted in like six million deaths. The Knights Templar, of course, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers, horseback, bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, the Navy SEALs of their time. Richard I, Lee leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary, you know? It wasn't ever like Richard the Billy Goat or Henry the Butterfly. Nah, we need fear. 300 years of religion, invasions, torture, political chess. It was the Wild West before the Wild West. Well, I guess the Wild East, the Wild Wild East, yeah. Number six, court. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. PETA would have an absolute field day with this next one. But again, it's like a thousand years ago and people were not really sure what they were doing back then. Some things were innovative and great, and then there was like trying a rat before a court of law for eating food. Yeah. It's 1386 in the Norman city of Falay, and ruthless and a rowdy crowd gathered to witness the execution of the city's most infamous convicted murderer. Spectators dressed in their best, and the prisoner was even given a last suit and a last meal for the occasion. I hereby sentence Mr. Wigglesworth to beheading. <gasps> gasps everywhere. Yeah, a pig. Yeah, they tried a pig and sentenced it to a beheading. Like, also, isn't that just called breakfast? For more than like 300 years all throughout Europe, strange lawsuits tried pigs, dogs, foxes, birds, even grasshoppers and slugs for crimes. Basically anything against people, property, and God himself. It started with creatures who had maimed or killed humans of importance, then animals that stole and ate crops, then like the snail made me do it type stuff. Yeah. Prosecution after prosecution. This stuff's weird, right? Your Honor, a small recess, please. 
Okay, basically what we're gonna tell them is that Number five, the Great Charter. Ah yes, time for some peace. Well, kinda. A peace treaty, the initial document containing specific grievances under King John's rule. The year is 1215. Since these animals can't follow the rules, maybe we need to jot up some rules to follow ourselves. A document setting out the laws and limitations for the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts to follow. Like, no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the Law of the land. Write all that down. Please write it down. Laws were important, and sometimes people needed to face the music. After John's death, the government of his son, Henry III, revised the document in 1216, dumbing it down in a little less strict and churchy book of rules type way. Less hearsay and more evidence kind of laws. Of course, still in folio, so V's were U's and L's were also the number one, so a little confusing sometimes, to say the least. Number four, Templars. The poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Templars. Temple of Solomon. I feel like you have to say that with a deep voice or it sounds weird. The Knights Templar, aka the Order of Solomon's Temple, or simply the Templars. Basically a Catholic military order group of one of the most wealthiest military groups in all of history. No pressure. Founded in 1119, based out of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a couple hundred years of this Navy SEALs type organization. Endorsed and encouraged under the Roman Catholic Church of Pope Innocent II. What a name. The Templars, an extremely trained super soldier outfit with the distinctive white mantles with the red cross. They were like the most skilled fighting units out of the entire Crusades Wars. What people don't know is about 90% of the organization was behind closed doors, ranging a network of financial techniques, manipulations, and treaties for the next thousands of years. Yeah, everybody focuses on the fighting part, but the chess game being played economically at the same time behind closed doors was much more terrifying. Basically, the world's first corporation with a security team. Number three, knights. Keeping with the themes of the medieval times, other outfits of highly trained religious secret organizations, knights, brotherhood, fighting, all that uh, good stuff. Another knightly order. The Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem. Also commonly known as the Teutonic Order. Thousand years ago again. Kind of like the Templars being a Catholic religious institution founded as a military society. We're talking 1190 in Jerusalem. It was formed to aid Christians and protect them in the Holy Lands where they would establish hospitals and churches. The Order, more of a small voluntary outfit made up of mercenary military memberships. Basically old dogs who could still fight were looking to do some private security work. The Teutonic Knights were rich too, which led them to hire older and more experienced mercenaries from all parts of Europe. Dude, this is where all these secret societies started, huh? Couple initiations, couple tattoos, couple secret scars. A religious mercenary group who would just truck through Europe, swinging swords in the name of God. What a time. Number two, jesters. In the 12th century, the title of Fool began, aka the jester was born. A paid career of mockery, smut, laughter and tricks. A true triple threat. Most of the time, after years of service, these jesters were rewarded with land as payment for their loyal service. A famous fool named Roland Le Petour was given 30 acres of land by King Henry II when he retired after his foolery, under one condition, that every Christmas day, Roland would return to the royal court to leap, whistle, and fart. Yeah. Just a whole year to write a seven minute banger of a set. No pressure. But it wasn't just farts and jokes for these guys apparently. Jesters also had a huge role in battles. At war, their job was to wage psychological warfare, boosting the morale of their side the night before with laughter, parties, and stories. And in the morning, when the two armies met, the jesters would ride or run between them, calming the nerves of their own side and men by making them laugh, singing silly songs, of course, and insulting the opposition. Yeah, just chirping the other team. This was a ballsy tradition. And most of the time, unfortunately, they were captured and sent catapulted back with a message from the other side. Imagine just taunting 5,000 bloody drooling men hopped up on IPAs and no sleep, just mocking them, like, to their face. No thanks. Number one, sports. Yeah, back then it wasn't a friendly game of handshakes and sportsmanship and stuff. More like no rules kind of sports. Like no rule soccer, AKA mob soccer. Yeah, I'm not talking about the mafia mob. I'm talking about a mob as an unruly amount of people running amongst each other in havoc. Yeah, town versus town. An unlimited amount of players. There was only two rules of this game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's line on the other side of town and no murdering. Yeah, no murdering. Okay, 
So this is rugby. This sounds a lot like medieval rugby, doesn't it? This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed even at Oxford University in 1555. Secret fraternities and training areas were all agreed on by each organization. The game got so competitive, bloody and out of hand, it was eventually banned at tons of different times in England. Quote, There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise which God forbids. We command and forbid on behalf of the king on pain of imprisonment such a game to be used in the city in the future. Damn. Like band band, huh? Thankfully the game of football has calmed down over the years. <laughs> yeah, right. Just go to a Manchester versus Liverpool game. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet, so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. 
know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's nose. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the middle ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. 
It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem Witch Trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands' or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Kicking off the list at number 10, leave. One of the first things you'd want to do if you magically were able to travel back to the Middle Ages is come right back. Yeah, it's not knights in shining armor and drinking unlimited IPAs in a heated cot. It was the Dark Ages. It sucked. More often than not, if you lived through the Middle Ages, you never left your village. Because where would you go? The world is also dark and dangerous. Nothing's built yet. You can't warm up in a coffee shop until your Uber arrives, right? Most travelers just slept outside or under some bushes. Records from that time show that the average person didn't travel in their entire life. The rest of this list should also explain why. Number nine, forget a watch. It's pretty easy to find out what time it is today. You can check your smartphone, you can check your watch, you can check your smart watch. We have everything. We don't even have to adjust the hours anymore during daylight savings. That's how easy it is now. You don't even notice anymore. You're like, why is it all of a sudden? Oh, got it. Apple, so good. Back in the Middle Ages, obviously it was harder to check the time. Minutes didn't even exist yet. Yeah, that was that tripped me out when I was reading this. The day was divided by seven long hours. They used water clocks, sundials, all that jazz, but none of them could really tell time to the minute. That long ago, the idea of a minute wasn't a thing. Christian monks were on a tight schedule for work and prayer, so they were actually the first recorded timekeepers in medieval Europe. Imagine being referred to as the recorded timekeeper. What time is it? I'm like, Eight. They're like, yo, he's good. Let's get the out of here. This guy's so good. Even so, the length of those hours depends on what time of year it is. Winter and summer months matter. As a Canadian, let me tell you, these dark, cold winters really do suck. It gets dark at like 4 p.m. now. Finish work. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to bed. I don't know. Number eight, forget a mask. The plague made a mark on humanity in the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't wear a mask and social distance. When Europeans were hit with the Black Death in 1348, fleas carried by rats were mostly to blame. Around one third of the population was killed and it was easily contracted. One sneeze later and your lungs are filling up with liquid. Life expectancy in the late 14th century was 20 years old because of this thing. There was little to no knowledge about germs or how they were spreading, so you'd be in the middle of a literal plague. There'd be bodies lying everywhere, people were dumping they're doo doo at windows. Be like, oh, good evening, madam. And then you'd inhale, and then number seven, get married. Love is in the air, and in the Dark Ages, marriage was difficult to do. This was long before divorce lawyers came around to get every last drop of you. It was so easy that if you loved somebody, you would just announce that now you're married. Chris, we're married now. Isn't that crazy? That's how easy it was. Boom. No need for a priest, big celebration, paperwork? Who has time for that? Nobody likes that. Sex before marriage, of course, was also a no-no, so if somebody just happened to wander into the wrong chamber and caught you doing the dirty, all you'd have to do is lie on the spot and say that you're married, and then be like, get out, weirdo, and they're like, ah, crap, they're married. We'll try again later. But more often than not, witnesses would be asked to be present when this marriage happened, because the sad reality is that guys would often go through all this, get in bed, do the mm-hmm, <laughs> and then deny ever agreeing to the union in the next town when he's shacking up with somebody else. Horrible. Number six. 
disturb the peace. When the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championships here, the place looked like Gotham City. Buses were flipped, there was garbage everywhere, people went nuts. Well, it's a good thing basketball wasn't around back in the Middle Ages because if you disturbed the peace in your local town, maybe you got too drunk, maybe you had an argument and got too loud, maybe there was even a scuffle in an alley, an old <laughs> one two. These situations that are common today usually end up with a slap on the wrist. They'll just send you in an Uber home or put you in the drunk tank. But do any of those things in the Middle Ages and you were locked up in the center of the town for an entire day. You'd be locked to the pillory while the town threw stuff at you and said horrible things. They would assault you verbally all day long in the sun. And depending how bad you were the night before and which town you upset, your punishment could be 30 minutes, it could be short and sweet, or it could be all day long and brutal. Both of these sound awful with a hangover happening at the same time. Hit that thumbs up and keep the peace. Huh? Number five, steal. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody, it was also pretty tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras, it was literally like Assassin's Creed. You would just throw your hood up, grab an apple, hide it, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and be like, yes, I got away safely. The markup for stealing was also pretty insane for the time, but it made sense. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times whatever you stole. So you'd better be a track star. If you're still on that pie, you're like, I gotta go. This is, my family needs this. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft, so you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Not trying to promote stealing here, but I'm talking about a time where people would risk their life to steal a loaf of bread for their family, you know? Not just like pickpocket a blackberry. But again, sometimes depending on where you got caught, you would lose an ear or you would lose a hand for stealing a cranberry. Anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. So run fast. Number four, blasphemy. When the Catholic Church was running the show during the Middle Ages, you better have been part of the God Squad or else you're gonna join them, apparently. Thomas Aquinas wrote about blasphemy in the Middle Ages saying that if we compare murder and blasphemy as regards to the object of those sins, it is clear that blasphemy, which is a sin committed directly against God, is more grave than murder, which is a sin against one's neighbor. On the other hand, if we compare them in respect of the harm wrought by them, murder is the graver sin, for murder does more harm to one's neighbor than blasphemy does to God. Yeah, that's, that's what you gotta deal with if you went back in time. Good, good luck, hope you're religious. If you spoke ill of the church and had beliefs of your own, God forbid, pun intended, that was one of the most wicked crimes to date. If you were charged with blasphemy, your tongue was removed with hot tongs or pliers. Awful. According to the Old Testament, other punishments would include stoning or hanging. All because you just, you said, I don't like him. I don't like that guy that does things. The way he's doing this, I'm hungry and I'm in pain and my family's dead. I don't know. Sorry. Blasphemy was common because you could accidentally do it, unlike stealing, you know? On my way to the studio today, I slipped on some ice, and let me tell you, if I was in the Middle Ages, I would have been charged twice before 9 a.m. Number three, live in the city. Okay, you may grow up wanting to live in the big city, eh? The Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. Whatever, whatever pulls you to the city, it would have been a lot different back then. Living in the city sucked. It was actually preferred to live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Like starving was better than this, really. If you were poor in the city, you had a short and nasty life. Cities were often built near rivers, but it didn't take long for said rivers to be full of sewage, stinky water. I mentioned the plague earlier. Just like today, numbers pop in large cities, so if disease hit the town, it hit the town pretty hard just constantly wiping out these packed crowds over and over. And maybe you're a fan of the nightlife. Maybe you wish you were able to hit up these local medieval taverns, have a ye old IPA, ale, whatever the hell. It wasn't even that fun. Curfews were strict, and if you were caught outside of that curfew, the odds of your drunk self getting robbed would be pretty high. Also, cities had public bathhouses too, which sounds nice, but again, during the Black Death, maybe let's not take a dip today. Let's, let's just wait. wait, let's just wait a week. Number two, wear stripes. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, but we never wear stripes. Medieval Europe, if you were caught wearing stripes, maybe you're trying to make a fashion statement, you could literally end up dead. There isn't a gang of mimes that will silently take you out if you wear their colors. No, stripes in medieval Europe was seen as the devil's clothing. There are accounts of real people getting arrested for wearing stripes. That's it. Where and when this began, it's hard to pinpoint, but in 1310, in the French town of Rouen, a cobbler was sentenced to death because he decided to wear stripes that day. It was a big deal though. It wasn't a law that changed depending on what town you're in. It was bigger than that. In 1295, Pope Boniface VIII banned religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. So it wasn't like, oh, this town's cool. You can wear stripes here. It's like, no, you're the devil. Bye. And finally, number one, 
witchcraft. Whenever we think back to the Middle Ages, it's hard to forget that we once would accuse others of being a witch. It's like five plus five, I think that's 10. We're like, how did you know that? You're a witch, you're definitely a witch. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. No better sous chef than a golden retriever. Just mix it up some potions. To be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so I don't completely disagree on that thought. But cats? What's a cat doing with a cauldron? On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused as well as two dogs. If their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Nothing to do with the poison rye, just all over the floor. It's for sure part-time witch. Villagers believe that witches traveled at night, not by broom, but by riding on the back of your furry friend. And it also wasn't just dogs or cats. They thought witches rode pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. I'd be like, I'm good, I'll beat you there. Even so, if you were convicted of being a witch, you had to confess. If you confessed to being a witch, your life was spared, and, and oddly enough, if you refused to confess, then you were executed. In the meantime though, being a witch and all, your head was being dunked in water, you were sleep deprived, these horrible torture methods were used until you were so broken that eventually you just admit to being a witch. You're like, fine, I, me and Airbud, we witch it up, happy, and then, you're fine. If you were suspected of witchcraft, you also had to get naked in front of all these creeps while they looked for the devil's mark. The devil's mark being a birthmark or a mole or freckle, blemish on the skin, whatever. All signs of making deals with the devil, apparently. This thing would have, I would have gone to jail for sure for this one. I would have been dead for this, that's huge. Number 10. Saving your pee-pee. Back in the day, whole families, monasteries, and public meeting places would collect the pee-pee deposited in chamber pots throughout the day. Yummy. They would take the amassed forbidden lemonade and either donate it, or if they were feeling enterprising, they could sell the wee wee to the town tanner or fuller. You see, the warm yellow liquid was used for the process of dyeing textiles and in the tanning of hides. Oh, and it was also used for cleaning clothes. Screw the smell of Tide and bounce dryer sheets, I'll take the smell of wetting the bed and grandpa's favorite chair, thank you very much. Urine was also used by physicians at the time to tell the health of their patients. I do this too. You know when it's clear and you feel like you're the most hydrated guy around? It's nice. I definitely don't taste it like the physicians back then though, or Saul Goodman in season five of Better Call Saul. I'll stick with apple juice for my favorite yellowish drink, thanks. Number nine, Belladonna, or commonly known as Deadly Nightshade. Now, what would our medieval ancestors be doing with such a lethal ingredient? Well, truth be told, it had a few uses. One of the more strange was for beauty. Belladonna had this strange effect on the pupils. The consumption of belladonna through eye drops or a liquid would result in dilated pupils, which for a long time in Europe was considered to be very beautiful. At least, it was considered beautiful. I don't know if that really is. The trouble, well, it's poison. It's like if you were complimenting me on my summer ready body, except I told you my secret secret was drinking Drano. Mm. To my surprise, however, this is an ingredient you can find today in certain medicines combined with other ingredients. In small doses, it makes it not harmful. I thought it would be fun to talk about all the side effects as fast as I can. Dry mouth, dry skin, inability to sweat, muscle spasms, blurred vision, enlarged pupils, hallucinations, inability to urinate, talk to Adam, convulsions, seizures, coma, acid reflux, fever, rapid heartbeat, gastrointestinal infection, high blood pressure, constipation, and more urination problems. Adam's the guy you need to talk to for that. Number eight, barber for a brain transplant. No, not actually. I don't think they even knew what a brain transplant was, let alone how to perform one. But in the Middle Ages, barbers were not just responsible for cutting your hair and giving monks that lovely bald thing going on top. No, they were also responsible for tending to the wounded after doing battle, taking care of the sick, and all the other medical services that the actual physicians were too good for. It's actually the reason we see those red and white spinning signs outside barbers, because it's symbolic of the bloody rags they would use to show that they could do the bloodletting required of monks in the Middle Ages. These barbers even formed a guild in the 13th century, lasting all the way up to the 18th century. Barbers are talented individuals. No one can cut my hair the way Tony does. Number seven, jesters. If you were to peer your nightshade eyes into a royal court, it might take a second because that stuff ain't good for it, you'll find a few things. First and foremost, you will see a king and his throne, the man who rules it all. Next to him would be a most beautiful queen, the woman who has it all. Hiding in the room upstairs are his mistresses. That's just how it goes. Loyal knights, advisors, cooks, everyone's here as Mr. Sakurai would say, except for one missing person. Who? 
me and, and Adam, the Jesters. Oh, uh, hi. Sorry. The Jesters, the Jokers. Yes, no royal court is the same without the Jester. The Jester's job was to just laugh. He's a ye olde comedian. Now, it might seem like it sucks, especially because, well, they wore strange attire and that hat was supposed to resemble that of an ass's ear or a donkey's ear, depending on what you want to say. But the Jester possesses a unique power. No, not the power to fart on command. That's my power. The power to speak freely, or at least more freely than most. This was a time when speaking out against the king could lose your head. The Jester could speak about the kings this way because, well, everything he said was taken as a joke. Some advice I think we could all take today. Number six. Everybody drinking. I recently went to go pick up some beers. And I went up to the cashier and I got my debit card out and prepped my ID. The cashier asked me, how do you want to pay? And I handed him my ID, being so accustomed to being confused for a prepubescent younger lad. He looked at me confused and said, nah, you're good bro. And boom, embarrassment. This interaction would never take place back in the medieval times because literally everyone was able to drink. It was usually the case to drink beer or wine and it was usually the case to drink beer or wine in place of clean water. Now they did have clean water before you all jump on me in the comments, but for when it wasn't on hand, beer and wine was accepted in its place. It was a common part of the medieval diet. I think they convinced themselves of this in the same way I tell myself it's okay to have another one. Well, it's made of greens with water, so that means it's healthy, right? Red wine is good for my heart, so drinking it right out of the bottle is okay, right? Probably not. Number five, helmeted chicken. Wind the clock back 10 years ago. I was but a humble freshman in high school. I was green behind the ears. I didn't know what to expect. Sure, people had prepped me for the worst, but I just didn't know what to expect. I got even more nervous when I saw the pretty girls showing up. Gosh, they were so pretty. <sighs> Someone be my girlfriend? But I relaxed. I knew I was okay because at lunchtime I was gonna watch my favorite YouTube channel, Epic Meal Time. Besides this one, it's a good channel, you should check it out. We're awesome. They made combinations of food that I didn't even think were possible. I was absorbed into their culture, and who wasn't? Why do I bring the awkward time of 2012 back up? Well, that's because the Medieval Times had their own version of a turducken. It, sort of. While it's not a chicken inside a duck inside a turkey inside a pig covered in bacon like EMT did, it's similar and perhaps off-putting for our veggie fans. Basically, there was a chicken sewn to a pig to look like a knight riding on a horse. And yes, I'm sure the chef washed his hands. Right? Number four, going to the schedule de -lifing. Entertainment wasn't as accessible or the same as it is now. In modern times, we pull up our phones, turn on our laptops, sit in front of the TV, and there is all the entertainment we need, from battles to baby drama. But back in the Middle Ages, there wasn't much to do after you were done your work for the day. There were forms of entertainment, music, theater, games, sports, etc. But a favorite would have to be going to see the latest ne'er-do-well lose their head. Public shows of punishment were not just something you went to see when you were bored. Actually, their more important purpose was as a deterrent for anyone who thought of maybe committing a crime. And yeah, that would do the trick. It was also a good way to finalize the trial of a criminal for all those who were affected or who were part of the village. Eventually, they became more of a private affair, but not entirely with the last public de-lifing in the United States happening in 1936. Let's not bring this one back. No, I'm good. I'll pass. Number three, witch trials. Speaking of scheduled delifing, witch trials, or rather, uh, get rid of anyone who's been deemed a witch, which, in case you didn't know, was uh, as simple as this. Right then, the young woman down the lane is smarter than her boys in the school. Right then, folks, pitchforks and torches it is. Unfortunately, for a lot of women at the time, it was tough. When has it not been, right ladies? While some men were declared witches too, this was a tool really for people with power to get rid of those who dare oppose them. There's too many royals to mention who took part in this, however, one stands out as bloody Queen Mary. Names like this were not given for no reason. She was known for sending witches and heretics alike to the stake to be cooked. Number two, outlaw. In movies and TV, characters named as outlaws, specifically in the Wild West sense, are seen as cool guys, outsiders, and wanderers with an air of mystery and possibly power. Trust me when I say it was not what you wanted to be, especially in the medieval times. If you were declared an outlaw in the Middle Ages, you lost all rights, possessions, and any kind of protection being part of society would give you, including people getting in trouble for ending your stay on this plane of existence. You were forced to fend for yourself with nothing to your name, 
And in a world rife with disease, wars, bandits, and very little readily available food or water, things get harsh quick. If you didn't have a buddy to turn to for help, who you knew for a fact would not literally stab you in the back, then you were pretty screwed. Luckily, I have Andrew. Right? Yeah! Number one, ladies. Okay, so let's say you're married. Husband tends the crops. You as the wife take care of the home. This isn't a statement about the patriarchy. I'm just saying taking care of the home is just as important back then. Seriously, it is. Well, your husband comes in from tending the fields one night with a fever. Uh-oh, he's fallen ill, and now he's perished. Now you're left alone with no income and a society that's probably not okay with you working. So that means it's time to pull up your pants. Well, actually, pull them down, as in a scenario like this, it would be time to work that street corner, and a lot of women did do that. The same way Adam works on building Legos in his dungeon. A joke. But as they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, and folks, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Tradition or not. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage right. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep. Go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a night and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. 
No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chainmail. My knees would buckle. No, thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. As an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats, I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like, you're exhausted and all of a sudden, you have to be like, huh, fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh. many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. 
Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, high pay, yeah. I would say this is the craziest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible, they're not really a thing, they didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming, so maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck, piles of it, just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of, eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad, it was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Number 10, starting off strong with Animal Court. That's right. In the Middle Ages, apparently, it was a regular thing that animals would be put on trial. It was believed that animals who committed a crime were possessed by the devil. Of course they were. Of course. And to let them go unpunished would give the devil the permission to take over human affairs. You don't want that. So they would be put on trial. Everything from hogs, beetles, rats, mice, cockerels, all have a history of being put on trial. In the 14th century, local people even prosecuted Spanish flies. Spanish flies were dangerous to livestock and would ruin vegetation, so needless to say, they weren't well liked. And they were appointed a lawyer, what kind of lawyer back then? No idea. And given great dignity in court, though the verdict was not favorable. They were condemned and banished from a plot of land. How exactly they enforced this? Who knows? An anywhere wedding, number nine. Apparently, back in the Middle Ages, shotgun weddings were like the thing. It was the to do. One must simply exchange a sincere vow for another, or not even sincere. It could be like, you wanna get married? Yeah, cool, awesome. And two people could be married. Considering the hot blood of the youth, this could happen anywhere, even after they had already done the deed. Therefore, keeping track of who was married to who got pretty confusing. So then the church finally decided to make marriage a holy sacrament 
which must be observed by God, but not only God. The families had to make sure the ceremony was official all the way to the wedding night. Very often the bride would be carried to the marriage bed by the family who would then stay to view the consummation of the union. That's right, the tickly boo, the boo boo, the jiggy. Yeah, yeah, that's right, your parents, your in-laws would wait until they saw you get jiggy with it. Number eight, the dancing plague. Not as much of a tradition, but an event that almost became one. When I first learned about the dancing plague, I was speechless and hopefully you will be too. Keep in mind the middle ages weren't colorless, but there were some pretty bleak times. Doctors debate whether this event was caused by bacteria in rye that can cause hallucinations like LSD, but no one can really be sure. It just kind of happened and it's well documented. All people know is that in Strasbourg in July of 1518, a woman named Frau Trafia started dancing in the street and by the end of the week 40 people joined in and by the end of the month 400 people joined in. It was nuts. It was like a massive never ending rave. Initially physicians thought folks were just stressed out so they even brought in professional dancers and musicians to like encourage the joyousness but then people started dying from heart attacks and fatigue. So by that point they were like oh, we better cut this off and so they whisked everyone off to uh, the mountaintop to pray and apparently that prayed the dancing away. Number seven, men's fashion. I may be making a big statement here, but considering men's fashion has been variations of the tux for over two centuries now, kind of, eh, that's a stretch. This may be one of, if not the most colorful periods of men's fashion. Men got pretty risky when with their attire, like you're kind of impressed. Anglo-Saxon men wore tunics, trousers, leggings, and strappy leather shoes tied together with belts and girdles. Doesn't sound too crazy yet, but wait. Cod pieces were in and tunics got shorter so they could see their front manhood. Also, very long shoes were a big thing. Uh, the longer the shoes, the richer you appeared and the more pronounced the cod piece. Well, I think you... I think you get the picture. Men who wore pointier shoes had a higher social position. Some shoes were so long that they had to be reinforced with a whalebone. They also adorned wide brim hats, felt caps, and hoods to protect their eyes during extreme weather. Number six, sexy and hairless. Women on the other hand had some even stranger qualifiers for beauty. Uh, while today having a thick and bold soap brow and a full head of hair is the ideal, it was the exact opposite for women in the middle ages. We have literally almost tried everything and I fear what happens next. Like women's fashion, we just, we've done a lot of stuff. Anyways, in the middle ages, a woman's forehead was considered the sexiest part of their face. Why? No idea. Maybe because her breath was so bad it was better to kiss her forehead, who knows. But either way, it was a big deal. So what women used to do to draw attention to it was pluck their eyebrows, hairline, and ashes away to make sure it highlighted that part of their face. So at very often they would just have no eyelashes, no eyebrows, and like their hair would be like this far back. Number five, Feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools was a very popular festival in the Middle Ages where everything turned topsy-turvy. On January 1st, specifically in France, they would elect a mock bishop or pope and low and high officials would change places. Kind of like an adaptation of the pagan celebration of Saturnalia, which we talked about in another video. Find it and post it below. People would wear hideous masks to conceal themselves from the festivities so they could behave fully in the activities. There would be parades throughout the city featuring drinking, singing, men would dress as women and vice versa, along with the general mischief. Even priests and clergy would be seen wearing masks during office hours and dance as women, panders, or minstrels. It was officially banned in the 15th century because it got too ridiculous and you know the piety of the people were like, this is a sin. But despite the ban, it still continued into the 16th century. It seems like a pretty hard party to imagine, especially considering how pious they were back then. Priests dancing in women's clothes? Crazy. I mean, technically they're already wearing kind of dresses, their long tunics. Number four, bloodletting. Along with traditions, there were certain medical practices that medieval physicians swore by. The most popular being bloodletting. Got a headache? Bloodletting. Have a flesh wound? Bloodletting. The plague? Hmm. Bloodletting. Emotions? Uh, maybe a little bit of bloodletting. It is exactly as it sounds. They would either make cuts to let the blood drip or more usually place leeches on the skin. 
The rationale behind bloodletting though is really important. It was related to the belief in the four basic humors, blood, phlegm, black bile and yellow bile. This translated to the four basic elements, earth, air, fire and water. Being ill meant something was off with the humors. And therefore, relieving an excess of humor was necessary. Therefore, if there was an excess of blood, it would be removed by bloodletting. If it was bile, they would purge it. Uh, blood was declared the dominant humor by Galen of Pergamum way back in 200 AD. So, bloodletting became the most popular. This tradition even lasted beyond the Middle Ages into the 18th century. In the 1800s, the French went through 40 million leeches a year. Uh, and also, things started to get weird when George Washington was bloodlet when he had got, fell sick with a cold, he died that way, it was a lot. Number 3, here lies the heart. As you can expect, death was everywhere in the middle ages. I probably, I wouldn't have made it past the age of 4. I had tonsillitis too many times. That's probably true for most of us. Making it past child rearing years for women was outstanding. For men you'd be lucky if you made it past 30. Tough times. So it only makes sense we talk about some of their unusual funeral rites. There were many superstitions around burials, fear of disease and even vampirism determined what would happen to the body. Eastern Europeans would stake bodies through the heart in order to keep them from returning. Especially if they had taken their own life, they would have to be beheaded. When a village was cursed by plague, drought, flooding or something other, they would dig up the bodies to investigate, sometimes burning them because they thought, ooh wow what's happening, their nails are retracting, they must be a vampire. During plague time, the normal burial methods were abandoned and they had to resort to mass graves. But on the battlefield there was actually a very sweet tradition. If a loved one died on the field and the body could not be transported back, the heart would be removed instead. It would either be kept in a box of ivory with spices or buried somewhere. Number 2, the mystery plays. If you weren't busy trying to avoid the black dead, then you might have attended something called a mystery play. Mystery plays were a sequence of performances referred to at times as the cycle plays. During the 15th and 16th century, before playhouses were even a thing, these plays were performed annually in the biggest towns in Britain. They were called mystery plays because they primarily addressed the miraculous mysteries of God himself. Throughout the whole course of the day, the whole arc of the universe from Garden of Eden all the way to Judgment Day was performed. They were organized and funded by acting guilds which was another reason as to why they were called mystery plays. The troops themselves were called mysteries. The troops were often made up of craftsmen who would use the show to show off their wares. The performers were ordinary people with a flair for the dramatic, but they had to be damn good otherwise they would get vegetables thrown at them. People looked forward to these performances all year round so it was standing O or nothing. And last but not least, soccer. Like most sports, soccer actually has a pretty violent origin, kind of like lacrosse, though it was still considered a game. Soccer, aka the more accurate title I have to say football because football had far less rules. It could have an infinite number of players and could take part across an entire village. The goals were sometimes set miles apart and the game would often be used to settle disputes. As a result, they would they got they got violent. They got really really violent. You could you could do absolutely anything in order to get the ball, save actually taking someone's life. It also wasn't strictly football, you could use any part of your body to, to get there. Wrestling, punching, kicking, scratching, tripping, you name it. If it got you a goal, fair game. But it is all fun and games until someone's eye gets poked out. In 1314, King Edward II decided it was time to put a damper on the game that was causing too much injury and property damage. He forbade the games and condemned any who disobeyed to imprisonment, but you can imagine that people didn't play by those rules either because uh, soccer still exists today somehow.